The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, and thank you for joining us. My name is Kate Neal, and I'm the Communications Specialist at the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston School of Public Health in Austin. Before we get started with today's presentation, I just wanted to make some housekeeping announcements. This webinar is being recorded and will be archived along with the presentation slides on our website at msdcenter.org. If you have any questions during the presentation, please enter them into your questions chat box. We will have time for a Q&A at the end of the presentation. I'll now hand it over to Deanna Helscher and Joel Romo to start their presentation on using the SPAN Data Explorer and Texas Child Health Status Reports for policy impact. So good morning, everyone. Uh, we're glad to have you join us today. Um, what we'd like to do is really talk about some of the uh, recent resources that we've made available at the uh, center for people to use to really look at and evaluate the health status of kids in Texas. So we'll tell you a little bit about that, uh, the resources, a little bit about how to use them, and then we'll follow up about how they might uh, be used to really achieve a better policy impact. So before I go on, I'd just like uh, to acknowledge that this is done uh, through the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living uh, with funding from the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation. Uh, we have a vision of healthy children in a healthy world, and part of doing that is to uh, communicate data that can be used to make a difference. So a little bit about the SPAN Data Explorer. So uh, the SPAN Data Explorer uses data from the 2015-2016 Texas School Physical Activity and Nutrition Project or SPAN. So SPAN is a data set that's been uh, developed and used in the state since uh, the year 2000. So the 2015-2016 uh, phase of the project, period of the project, was actually the fourth time that we've done it. Uh, just to let you all know, we're currently in the field collecting data for the 2019-2020 yes. SPAN project, and we are really hoping to have those data available before the next uh, session, legislative session in 2021. Uh, SPAN is unique in several different ways. Uh, first, it provides representative data. So the data that we have uh, are data that show what the population um, is for the rates of the prevalence of overweight obesity and then several other uh, related factors. So the factors that underlie obesity that are included in SPAN uh, co are comprised of things like dietary behaviors, uh, nutrition, knowledge, and attitudes, physical activity. We've got data on uh, sleep, for example, um, and then breakfast consumption. So there's a lot of other data within this data set. Um, not only do we have data from Texas, but we also have it by region of Texas. So you can look in, say, the Houston area and see what the prevalence of obesity among kids is there. Uh, you can look in West Texas. You can look at the Lubbock area um, and get a general understanding of how the prevalence of uh, overweight and obesity varies across the state by region. You can also look uh, for these different behaviors that I mentioned by region. Um, the third way in which we have representative data is that we have data by the Texas-Mexico border versus the rest of Texas. So you can look at how those counties that are adjacent to the Texas-Mexico border, how they differ from the rest of the state. Um, a little bit more about SPAN is SPAN is, uh, was developed to look at different age groups as well. So we look at data from second graders, fourth graders, eighth graders, and 11th graders. Uh, we use those uh, different grades to represent different levels of development, child development. So second graders are uh, 
more pre-puberty and the fourth graders are as well. Um, eighth graders are kind of peri-puberty, so right around the pubertal area, uh, pu pubertal, sorry, period. And then 11th graders are post-puberty. Uh, they also represent, the second and fourth graders represent elementary school, the eighth graders represent middle school, and then the 11th graders represent high school. SPAN has been conducted by researchers here at the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living at the UT Health School of Public Health in Austin, and we've received funding from the Texas Department of State Health Services. So we're very appreciative of our partnership with DSHS uh, that has allowed us to collect data over these different time periods. So what you see here is a, is a screenshot of the SPAN Data Explorer. So I wanted to show you a couple of things about the Explorer. So first off, you can see the uh, URL at the top that tells you where you can go to access the Explorer. Uh, if you look across the top uh, horizontally, there are a series of uh, different um, different names that you can click on. So the Span Data Explorer uh, talks a little bit about Span. It tells you what Span is, the times that we've done it. If you, if you click on the diet link above, uh, it will show dietary data. If you click on the physical activity sedentary behavior data, it will show data that relates to those topics. And so for this one right now, we're looking at health status. So that's why that is highlighted on the slide here. So if you look then to, uh, if you're facing your uh, the PowerPoint, if you look to the left, it talks about exploring health status variables. So that's the name of that section. And then you can select a variable. So for this particular uh, example, we've chosen weight status and there's a five category weight status. There's also a four category and a three category. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about those later. But if you look at the region, you can either select statewide or by health service regions. Um, you can look at the group variables. So you can look at it by no grouping, or you can look at it by race, ethnicity, or border, non-border. Um, you can also look at many of these by boy, girl, as you can see as represented there. Um, and then you can look at it by grade. So you can select which grade you wanna look at. So how you would use this is you would go to the left panel and you would select in each of those areas, which region you want to compare, um, the group variables, how you want the variables grouped, and then by grade. And then you would click generate at the bottom. And what you would see is uh, the output as is on the right side of your screen. So this output shows weight status in five categories. So these range from underweight, uh, healthy weight, uh, overweight, which is the 85th to the 95th percentile, uh, obesity, which is the 95th percentile, and then extreme obesity. So the extreme obesity is 120% of the 95th percentile. So these are kids that are analogous to extreme obesity in adults. So if you look at that, you can also look at these by three categories. So healthy weight, overweight, and obese, or you can look at the children by four categories, uh, which would be healthy weight, overweight, obese, and then extreme obesity. So these are very helpful in that you can look at data from each region to see how the patterns are different. And then you can also look at the classifications for each region. So here's an example of the five category weight status for 11th grade by race or ethnicity. So if you look back to the previous slide, I'll just go there for a second. You have the ability for the group variables, uh, which are on the left, to look at no grouping, race, ethnicity, and uh, border, non-border. 
Uh, so this would be if you had clicked the race ethnicity uh, category for group variables there. And so going back to that slide, what you can see is at the top is the whole uh, population, the whole sample. So this gives it for the state as a whole. Uh, the Y axis is axis is the number of students, and then the X axis is the category of white status. So you can compare different racial ethnic groups. And it, if you look below the whole sample, you can see it broken down by boys and girls. So you really can see some definite differences in the patterns here between boys and girls for some of the different racial ethnic groups. So the SPAN Data Explorer is part of uh, some other resources that we have developed for our Healthy Children, Healthy State initiative. And so although we know that there are a lot of different state level indicators of child health in the state, uh, a lot of these data are not packaged and accessible. And especially if you're looking at regions of the state, you can't always distinguish between them. So one of the things that we have done um, through our center has developed a series of user-friendly materials. And these include reports and one-pagers that kind of highlight uh, different topics in child health in Texas. And we're really focusing on health disparities. So the series of reports uh, is entitled Healthy Children, Healthy State. And these can be used by anyone. The, they are on our website. They can be printed off. Um, and we intend for people to use them to raise awareness of child health risk factors. And part of this is we want to use these to develop new programs and actions, especially for areas in which we have higher rates than other states or higher rates than the US in general. And we also want them to build on current initiatives in Texas. So the current Texas health status reports include uh, the obesity crisis, the nutrition crisis, one on physical activity, and one on screen time. So I'm going to go through each of these just real briefly just to show what they have on them. So the one that talks about the child obesity data talks about obesity being a major public health crisis in Texas. Uh, I know we've heard a lot about other health issues in Texas, but if you really look at prevalence and impact both on current and future cost, medical cost, obesity really ranks among the highest, um, especially when you're talking about children. So if you look at this, um, if you look at the uh, one pager on the left, we have some facts that are from uh, the SPAN data as well as other sources of data. Um, we also show some trend data. So you can see some graphs there at the right that show some trend data over time using our SPAN data. Um, and then we also provide just a little bit of context in terms of what we have in the boxes entitled uh, Childhood Obesity is Risky and Childhood Obesity is Costly. So those link back to some uh, evidence-based reports, uh, some data-driven reports that kind of show why obesity is such a, a public health problem in Texas. Uh, for the nutrition, for nutrition status of children in Texas, we have a similar one pager. So on this one, you can see that the data are at the in the middle, where under under the uh, titles of nutrition crisis and current and lifetime risk. So those again draw on current references. Um, and then at the bottom, where it says how we can improve Texas children's nutrition we have some data-driven solutions and recommendations that have been drawn from our studies and other studies uh, that have been conducted in similar populations. So this is really, if you look at the data in Texas, some of these statistics are a, a little bit concerning um, because on a given school day, as you can see, about 32% of Texas children do not eat any vegetables. So that's over two and a half million. 
So that's really a problem uh, when we know that fruit and vegetable consumption is associated with better health outcomes. Uh, we also have problems with kids skipping breakfast and then with Texas children eating a lot of sweet or salty snacks. The child physical activity one pager is shown on the PowerPoint slide now. So with physical activity, again, what you see is in the middle, you see some data from our SPAN survey and other surveys. And then at the bottom, you can see some other uh, data-driven recommendations that we have. Um, we do know that children don't meet current guidelines of 60 minutes or more of physical activity. And, uh, but we, on this one, we also highlight some kind of good trends. For example, we're seeing that uh, in elementary school that, that teachers are leading physical activity breaks, which we know really helps in the learning environment. Uh, we could do better in middle schools and high schools, but at least we're seeing some uh, positive trends in those areas. Um, one thing that I forgot to mention earlier, uh, with these one pagers, in the front, you have the data and the recommendations. If you look at the back of these uh, one pagers, it lists all the references, so all the citations that we used. So for those of you that want to go back and look at the original references, you have an opportunity. You can have an opportunity to do that. The last one that we have prepared to date is about child screen time in Texas. So this is a range similar to the previous two. But uh, one of the things that we found is that a lot of kids have televisions in their bedrooms. Um, and we know that having a TV in your bedroom makes it harder to uh, control what kind of commercials that children see, particularly in terms of uh, diet and foods being advertised. And it's associated with a higher prevalence of children with obesity and overweight. Um, we also know that a lot of kids uh, have uh, some link to the internet in their bedroom at night. Uh, so that's something we really need to look at in terms of sleep hygiene. Um, and then we know, as you know, kids spend a lot of time playing video or computer games. So these show you some of the data from our survey. So we have a couple of other child health status reports uh, that are underway right now. So one is on sleep quality. Uh, what I can tell you from that is that kids aren't getting enough sleep. Uh, and part of that might be related to some of the screen time that data that you saw previously. And then we're also looking at sugar sweetened beverage consumption. So uh, down at the bottom of this slide, you can kind of see an example of uh, some of the data that is coming out from our survey that will likely make it onto this report. So these reports are also being used by one of our projects, which is the Texas Research to Policy Collaboration Project. And the goal of this project is to improve the health of Texans uh, through policy making and particularly through informed policy making. So what we're doing with this is engaging, uh, we're engaging both policymakers, uh, state legislators, as well as researchers uh, together so that researchers can provide policymakers with the data that they need, particularly local data to make informed decisions about policy regarding health, specifically child policy. Um, so at this point in time, we're doing capacity building and these uh, resources that I've shown you are part of that capacity building. Uh, eventually, we're going to match at least 10 state and local policymakers with Texas RPC network members. But these materials that we develop and this network of researchers that will be able to provide data to the legislators will be resources that all legislators can use. We really want we will really want people to use these networks as much as possible. Uh, during the session and even before the session, beginning next year, we will be compiling information to respond to state legislative requests. So we really want to turn these requests around quickly and connect uh, legislators to 
uh, researchers who can talk about Texas level data and data from other parts of the country that might be able to help them uh, in their help them as they develop new policies or tweak old ones. And so my contact uh, information is provided on the slide there and we can show that again at the end. But what I'd like to do now is hand the webinar off to Joel Romo, who is the Vice President of Governmental Affairs at the Cooper Institute. And I will answer any questions at the end of Joel's presentation. So I'd like to welcome Joel and thank him for helping us with this webinar. Thank you, Deanna, and welcome to all those listening out there in the webinar land. Um, appreciate the opportunity to be here today and highlight um, how these Texas Child Health Status Reports have uh, impacted policy today and, and it can impact them tomorrow. Um, I've Again, we've uh, worked together with Deanna over the years wearing many hats and appreciate the opportunity to always share additional information and strategies in terms of advocacy and policy. Um, I would like to share something a little bit that uh, kind of sets the tone for um, the status, the health status reports. On the uh, next slide there, there's a quote from Dr. Kenneth Cooper, the founder of the Cooper Institute. Um, there's a fitness gram report, but if you, the next little quote there mentions um, that data drives decisions. Uh, obviously, based on the fitness gram, there's a lot of data that can be collected and correlates with some of the work done at the Dell Center. But um, Dr. Cooper's uh, committed his life to research, education, and advocacy. Um, and it's uh, up, we enjoy the opportunity to partner with the group here and share how data can help drive decisions. Um, and moving forward, you also, everybody's familiar and everybody knows the, the connection between fitness. Uh, is associated with improvement in academic achievement, discipline, and attendance. If you look at the next slide there, there is significant uh, data that reinforces that. Um, and so with the re research that is done by the Dell Center, we realize that there's opportunities to continue increasing the health and wellness and the correlation between academic achievement, discipline, and attendance, and really that's something that lawmakers sometimes don't miss the connection to. Um, and so we are here today to help you understand how we can further that mission. Um, moving on, as has been shared regarding the child health status report developed by the Dell Center research team and advisory and the advisory team. Um, I also wanted to mention that the advisory team is a laundry list of 20 plus excellent organizations that have come together and worked with Deanna and her team over the last couple of years um, in developing these reports, wording them so that they are user friendly for lawmakers, um, making sure we address the key points that lawmakers may want to focus on, and also providing some insight from each respective organization and their research, whether it be the American Heart Association, Cancer Society, Pediatric Society, etc everybody's been working collaboratively to develop these reports and provide guidance. Um, and as mentioned, these resources can help make great changes at our schools, our homes, our communities, and then of course, eventually statewide. So let me share a little bit of, with, of how these health status reports provided some successes at the Capitol this past legislative session that just completed in May of 2019. Um, through different groups, that utilize these reports, many of them that you'll see a list at the end, such as the Partnership for Healthy Texas, the Texas Public Health Coalition, and other individual groups. These reports were shared with lawmakers and staff and highlighted the importance to support key proposals. And this is just a sample of, of a handful of proposals that with these reports, we were able to move the needle and get some of these pieces of legislation passed that are now making an impact. One of those being uh, Senate Bill 952 that uh, updated and approved the minimum standards for state licensed child care centers for nutrition, physical activity, and screen time guidelines, as well as a bill relating to uh, Senate Bill 13, 1834, which directs the Health and Human Service Commission to conduct a study on local SNAP incentives programs. And it also allows for that 
uh, agency to create a pilot and apply for Farm Bill funding. And then, of course, being able to preserve fitness grab, there were efforts to repeal some of the language there that would keep the physical fitness assessment requirement in place. And this is just, again, a handful of bills that were positively impacted to make an impact on children's health and address the obesity crisis in our state. And I also want to, to share with you that these pieces of information, the reason they're so important and critical is that this is almost, you could say, Texas grown data. This is data that is based in Texas. And as uh, someone that walks the halls on a daily basis, lawmakers like to know that their data that they're looking at is based in Texas. Um, obviously, they are wanting to know more about what they can do to impact their district or to make a greater impact across the state. And so as lawmakers right now are working on different during the past session, that's one of the key reasons that this was successful in that these reports, once when they were distributed and shared with lawmakers and staff and committee offices and leadership, once they realized this data was developed locally and how this data would help drive some changes in their community and their state, we were able to garner support as well as with the other activities that were done by different groups through their grassroots efforts, lobbying efforts, volunteers, and and the great work that is done collectively to address these policies. Um, so there's some great opportunities to move, as you can see, to move the needle on public health policy. But now I think it's a good time for a call to action in terms of what can everyone do and with these reports and how they can be utilized. Um, I'm gonna start off with things that can be done now locally uh, in your campus, in your areas, in your communities. These school child health reports can be utilized by school health advisory councils to advise their school boards and principals and campus leaders on, on state policy opportunities. There is a great disconnect in terms of what school boards really may know or not know on what school policies are in place, what their status is of their obesity rates. And so these reports can be shared with those, not only with the shacks, but the leadership um, as well as helping preserve and promote evidence-based curriculum at the local level, which increases physical education, nutrition, and health programs in schools. Um, engaging some of the PTAs. Uh, there's toolkits that are there on the website that will provide resources for changing policy um, at the local level and engaging PTAs or the Action for Healthy Kids or It's Time Texas or any other groups that work with local schools uh, city councils, county governments. Uh, these are, you would be surprised about the uh, lack of knowledge that elected officials at the local and state level have in terms of their public health policy. Uh, whenever you share this data, they will be alarmed. They'll think, well, I thought everybody was doing PE. I thought we had taken all these meals out of the schools. So really the call to action here is a great opportunity to arm yourself with the data and make changes uh, not only at your local level, but at the state level and capitalize on the fact that this is an educational opportunity that you can use with your groups and your uh, respective organizations to engage at the local level. Additionally, um, these reports have come at a good time. If we look at the next slide, with the legislature having adjourned and starting working on projects for the 2021 legislative session, it's a good time to get to know your lawmakers, uh, visit with them in district, uh, organize a, a meeting with your lawmakers at their district office or have them come to your campus and to your camp, tour your campus or, or visit with your uh, administrators about some of the policies you'd like to see addressed. Um, or thank them. There's also, you can thank them for those bills you just saw pass, but also you can open the opportunity to educate them on the crisis that we have at hand, but address some of these various programs, whether it be nutrition, physical activity, um, or screen time, and, and, and have them learn more about how it's impacting te Texas and costs. Uh, as the lawmakers are looking at policies over this next year, before the next session in January of 2021, there are gonna be committees uh, having hearings on healthcare costs, 
uh, workforce, behavioral health, and rest assured that all these organizations that I mentioned earlier from the Partnership for Healthy Texas, the Public Health Coalition, and all the individual organizations are already working on strategies to go and, and, and testify before these committees and, and make some of these recommendations based on uh, data from these child health reports. But you can help get some support by, as I mentioned earlier, visiting in district with your lawmakers. Um, and, I, and one of the things that really continues to shock us is that there are lawmakers that didn't re that do not realize there's not as you know there's challenges of PE there's lack of a statewide health policy uh, there's not an understanding of that <clears throat> while while educators uh, are required to do certain re educational curriculum there's not a place such as a health class to do these so we encourage you again this is a great time they're out looking to learn more. Uh, about their community. It's an election year. Um, the, this toolkit can really help impact change. Uh, you can engage some state health, some of your uh, school health advisory councils. And um, remember that um, the best volunteer is a well armed and educated volunteer. These are great tools, great reports that could be utilized in your community. And I also want to say that there is um, some great opportunities that we may reach out to you. And if you're interested in coming to testify about successes or challenges in your communities, in your schools, um, we are looking for volunteers to join us in walking the halls, uh, testifying before committee. If you're really passionate about wanting to make a policy change, um, all our organizations that I've mentioned before will work with you and training you and helping you uh, share these key points from these health reports before a legislative committee. Uh, particularly, specifically, uh, obviously we can cultivate it, develop depending on what specific area you'd like to focus on. Um, you know, and, and one thing we also want to remember that you are training our future workforce in our schools. Our young people are the future workforce. Um, so going back to that absenteeism, that cuts both ways in terms of students missing school because of chronic diseases uh, and parents having to miss their work day or a few hours to take their child to doctor's appointments. So, um, you know, the workforce is impacted in Texas and we pride ourselves in Texas right now in terms of recruiting new and companies and businesses. Uh, but our workforce really is here in Texas in terms of the school children that, that are in our classes. Um, we need to ensure that not only do they graduate, uh, but they graduate healthy and they graduate uh, with the capability of entering the workforce without being a, a burden on the society in terms of chronic disease and healthcare costs that um, would be significantly impacted and deterrent from them advancing in their careers. Um, but we can message that with you. Um, so there's opportunities to utilize this, these toolkits that, are, that has been shared with you here today. And um, also, I wanted to share, this is a great time as to share this information with you because as we look forward to key legislative dates, um, while the legislature did adjourn this past May, we're in the middle of committee hearings starting to discuss issues. There was just a committee hearing on health and human services that some of our partners uh, worked and testified in terms of vaping. Uh, there'll be other key issues that will be relating to uh, physical activity, healthcare costs, as I mentioned, um, and PE that will be held at the Capitol over the coming months as lawmakers start preparing their legislative packages, uh, getting updates on agencies, implementing specific pieces of legislation, and identifying what key policies they want to work on in the 2021 legislative session. And these reports can go hand in hand with making their decisions as well as with the research collaborative in terms of providing them um, some academic assistance in developing their policies that we know is based on ground on science and um, true research. And, and the, the plus is again, I can't resonate, uh, um, share this enough, is that it is Texas grown data. Additionally, you I do want to share some of these dates. Um, part of this is just also the policy nerd in me. Uh, as you look at March 3rd, it's a primary election. 
Um, after you, after the holidays, it's a great time to reach out to lawmakers or prospective lawmakers that uh, and get on their calendar and visit with them about these issues that are important to you, as well as your local school boards, uh, local cities. There are numerous policies that will be addressed uh, in Texas over next year relating to uh, walking trails, school health advisory councils, um, parks and recreation issues that uh, you can get engaged in or share the data. And you never know where that one piece of information that you share may, may advance a policy at the local level and turn into a statewide policy in the future. And then of course you have the November election in 2020, which will elect our, our House and Senate and other offices across the country for uh, sessions that will begin in January of 2021. But the reason all these dates are important is that we are less than a year away from the day they can start filing legislation for the 2021 session. November 9th is the first day that lawmakers can start filing bills to drive discussion on policy uh, everything from the state budget to transportation to health care to education to um, you name it, everything will be on the table in January of 2021. And any policies that your organization or your group would like to see advanced, you really need to start working on those issues now and have some data to reinforce um, the reasoning behind the request you may be making. So that is the reason that I threw out some of these dates is that uh, while it may seem far off, the January, the 87th legislature begins January 12th of 2021. So we're not far away from that date. And then the next slide uh, I wanted to share with you provides um, some resources for those that may want to get engaged, um, track some information. There are different coalitions that have worked on these policies uh, this past session the Texas Public Health Coalition, the Partnership for Healthy Texas. If your organization is not part of these coalitions and you're interested, please reach out to them, um, as well as the Michael Susan Bell Center for Healthy Living. Uh, just a reminder of where you can find the reports, the toolkits, um, and additional data that may be helpful. Uh, and during the session, uh, they also track legislation that uh, is helpful. And if you're interested just at the local level and you want to stay engaged and follow and update your local leaders uh, and your, your, your sphere of influence, uh, this is a great toolkit to use. Again, um, I, we, on behalf of the various organizations that I have the opportunity to work with, um, we appreciate the child health reports and the impact they make on public policy. Um, the data, again, is important for lawmakers to know that this is Texas data. And while they are looking for resources, uh, these is a priceless jewel, a gem of information that you could share with lawmakers. And sometimes it comes better from the grassroots area than for those of us that walk the halls. So that's the reason we also want to encourage you to share this information from your school district to your elected official um, that eventually can help drive policy change and make our jobs easier as we work as we work on these policies at the Texas Capitol for you. Um, with that, I will say thank you for your time today, and I uh, think at this time we will turn it over to questions. Great, thank you, Joel and Deanna. Um, so, as Joel said, we'll go ahead and take some time for questions now. So you can type those either into your chat box or into the questions box. And it looks like we have a couple for Joel right now. Um, so we'll just jump right in. Joel, could you talk a little bit more about the meetings around shacks that would take place during the interim session and what you might see there? So um, just a little quick history. This past session, there were efforts to repeal the requirement for shacks to be um, required in our public schools. Um, what we're looking at right now is success stories of positive policies that have been changed as a result of SHAC engagement, um, the impact they make at the local level and their, their importance. Um, we do expect some discussion over the interim on the elimination of SHAC. So my question really is to the audience is, any success stories you have on, the, on successes of policies or the importance of shack work at the local level please share that with us 
and then we can highlight that and reinforce the need to maintain the SHAC requirement in Texas. There are numerous groups uh, that, are, that are concerned about this. Um, we've been meeting with Tapered, Mission Readiness, and others to start developing um, kind of a, a positive uh, reinforcement on the need for SHACs. So I expect some interim hearings to, to develop on SHACs, but also we're looking for success stories, kind of a preemptive so we can be proactive on preserving our SHACs. Great. Um, so we do have a question here for Deanna as well. Do public charter districts have the opportunity to participate in SPAN and or fitness gram? So I can address SPAN and uh, Joel would be a better person to address fitness gram. Uh, with our SPAN representative sample, uh, it represents the children uh, that are enrolled in public schools in Texas using Texas Education Agency data. Um, if the school is classified as a public school, it will be included in our sample. If not, uh, it will not represent our sample. Uh, it will not be represented in our sample. And the reason why we do this is to draw our sample. We need to have uh, baseline data on demographics and some other factors within those and so some of the schools outside of that don't have a data set that we can draw from. Um, now, to participate in SPAN, if a school or school district uh, that is not included in the public health, uh, I mean, in the uh, public school system would like to participate, we have uh, information and surveys and can address that separately. Joel, uh, so can oh. you hit the point quick on that question one more time? Yes. So do public charter districts have the opportunity to participate in fitness, Graham? You know, I, I, I'm going to have to say, I'm going to have to get back to you on that one. I, I don't want to give the wrong answer. I think they do, but I, but I can't confirm that. I can follow up. Okay. Um, and then we have another question here for Deanna. Um, for the Texas Research to Policy Collaboration Project, could you give an example of what one of those um, legislative requests might look like? So a legislative request uh, that we could answer might be um, something to the effect of what are um, it, it could either take the form of data. So, for example, if they were interested in the prevalence of data in a specific uh, area of Texas or along the border versus the uh, interior of Texas, that might be a legislative request. Uh, another legislative request would, might be to talk about uh, how much sleep kids are getting if somebody was interested in um, like a program. Uh, to encourage sleep hygiene. So they might want to know what are the prevalent, what's the prevalence of kids who get inadequate sleep. Uh, so those are the kind of requests we can respond to. Um, another, in another topic area that we deal with here at the center, it might be uh, what is the prevalence of kids vaping? So that might be another type of question that we get. Um, Another kind of uh, quest request that we could handle or that we are intending to address might include something like uh, what are programs or what are policies that have been shown to be effective for um, taking the sleep hygiene question for uh, helping kids uh, get more hours of sleep at night. Or what are policies that might help kids eat more fruits and vegetables? So those are the types of information that we can provide. Uh, we can also talk about evaluations of some policies that we've engaged in as part of our research. So for example, what type of uh, projects in schools tend to produce better results? So we can give you that kind of information that might help policymakers. Great. Um, well, it looks like we are out of questions unless somebody has one they want to type in really quickly. 
Um, this webinar will be archived on our website at msdcenter.org. We will share it via email and through social media. So if you want to rewatch or share with anybody in your networks, please feel free. And it looks like we have no further questions. So thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. We appreciate you being here. Um, and thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.